So it's my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Sa Sandra Godden from the University of Minnesota first. Um, she teaches there, um, is involved with pharma outreach and research, um, and this is her first visit here to the UK, so I'd like you to give her a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay at the back? Yep. Good. Excellent. All right. My challenge for this morning is to chew gum and talk at the same time, pointer, advancer, and not trip over the big monitor that you probably can't see in front of me here. Uh, I do want to thank the conference organizers for the invitation to be here this week. Uh, this is a privilege for me. This is uh, my first trip to the UK, as was mentioned. I spent last week in Scotland touring around with my family. It was gorgeous and uh, England is equally gorgeous, and uh, you're, you're just appreciate what you have here. It's a, a beautiful country. Um, so without further ado, I guess we'll get on to the Yoni's topic. Uh, we've been researching Yoni's disease and Yoni's disease control for about, f well, I've been at the University of Minnesota for about 15 years now. I grew up in Canada on a dairy farm. I did all of my training in Canada, practiced a couple of years there and somehow made my way to Minnesota, which is north of where I grew up in Canada, which is an odd thing. Um, but upon arriving in Minnesota 15 years ago, uh, there was a big push by the US, USDA to uh, invest in Yoni's research, uh, understanding the disease better and disease control. And so what I'm going to do today, hopefully, is review a lot of the clinical trials, the research that has been done over the last 10 or 15 years. It's a, it's a big body of work by a, a large group of people around the US and Canada and, and kind of summarize what we've learned about disease control programs. And the reason we're here talking about Yoni's disease, it's not just because it's an economically important disease to the producers, it's not just that it's a welfare issue for the cows, but as you all know, there's, there's crones looming over there in the corner, and, and the evidence is building. There's still not, you know, it's not confirmed as a causal organism for crones, but there's more and more observational evidence accumulating, suggesting it might play a role. It could be a multifactorial disease, Yoni's, or MAP, Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, the, the bug that causes Yoni's disease, um, could play a role in Crohn's disease. And so that is looming for all of us, in North America, <laughs> Europe, wherever, um, that shoe could drop, you know, at some time in the future, and we have to more aggressively tackle this disease, just not from our own perspectives of being a production or welfare disease, but also uh, related to human health or public health. So that's the background. Um, see if I can get my advancer to work. And it's not. Is there a? I have to press it really hard. Oh, oh, thank you. Great. Um, all right. So just I'll get the acknowledgments out of the way. As I mentioned. Uh, the clinical trials, the results I'm going to present today are representing a body of work from a large number of people working together independently around the, the country, large number of, of faculty, um, graduate students. I'm not going to go into everybody's names. I'll, I'll name individual people as we go through individual studies. Um, and, and a lot of this research, as I mentioned, was funded through the USDA. Um, but there are um, the Yoni's Disease Integrated Program, actually, that was USDA money that, that funded that big project. Uh, the University of Minnesota Center for Animal Health and Food Safety has, has funded some projects within Minnesota, Board of Animal Health, Wisconsin, et cetera. So lots of different players uh, supporting this research. Just a little bit of background. I'm sure you're all aware, but just a, a recap. If you're not, Yoni's disease or uh, paratuberculosis uh, is caused by the organism Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, which is a cousin, if you will, of um, Mycobacterium bovis, the organism that causes TB, and that's an issue in, in our countries as well, our continents as well. Uh, but this particular one, it's a very slowly progressing chronic disease. It can take years to progress to clinical signs, even if it ever does progress to clinical designs, signs. But if it does uh, progress, we end up with um, a chronic granulomatous inflammatory response in the intestines. The intestines become thickened, 
so that the animal can't absorb nutrients. And so, in effect, the animal starves. So the animal is eating, it's getting the nutrients, they're entering the, entering the digestive tract, but it's not absorbing those nutrients. So the animal wastes away. So we end up with a chronic diarrhea, intermittent at first maybe, but progresses to a chronic diarrhea and a progressive wasting. And of course, fertility and milk production plummet when this happens. The clinical signs in the advanced stage is chronic diarrhea, weight loss, um, and there is no practical treatment or cure for this. Yes, you could put these animals on long-term courses of antibiotics, but then they wouldn't be food-producing animals anymore. So it's, it's just not a practical thing to, to think that we're going to treat any of these animals. Um, in terms of, of production impacts, uh, economic impacts, um, it, it hurts us through premature culling of these animals, um, reduced va value at slaughter, obviously, if you're trying to market that animal. And prior to culling, there's reduced milk yield, reduced fertility, uh, and, and mortality, although hopefully animals rarely progress to dying on farm. Hopefully producers are going to be culling those animals before they get to that stage. Push hard on the button. Okay. Um, again, just part of the review. There. Um, we have different stages of the disease, starting with subclinical infection or stage one. So these are, these are animals that have been exposed, are infected, but we don't know it. They look clinically normal to us. They're performing well, doing well. Um, if we were to test them with fecal culture or fecal PCR or a serum ELISA test, they could very well come up negative on the test because they haven't mounted an immune response yet. Um, stage two, this could take months or even years, we can get subclinical shedding of the organism in feces. Um, that will eventually progress to stage three or clinical Yonis disease, and that's the, the thin, you know, the weight loss, the scouring cow, and then advanced clinical signs. And the, the concern is that the, the clinical cow that we see is the tip of the iceberg. So if you have one clinical cow diagnosed in your herd, there may be many, many subclinicals waiting in the wings to emerge later. That's the concern. In the United States, um, the estimated economic loss associated with the disease, there, there are various studies and everybody's got a slightly different number as to the cost, but here's a couple of examples. Um, according to USDA data, um, if you are in an infected herd with more than 10% of your cull cows being culled with clinical signs, so that would be a, a pretty highly infected herd, um, they estimated a $245 loss per cow in the herd, not per cow culled with clinical signs, but per cow in the herd. Um, and over the industry, they estimated about a $200 million annual loss uh, associated with this disease. Uh, this is Iran Reisman's work. It was done in Minnesota specifically, not the broader U.S. Um, he estimated that for <coughs> fecal culture positive cows, they produce roughly 1,300 kilos less milk in that last lactation and were three times more likely to be culled. So they culled, were culled early and a $441 loss for that cow. So regardless of whatever number you want to pin on it, it's, a, it's an ec economically important disease. The biology of this disease, um, the animal is infected. Uh, this, this work comes from Bob Whitlock who actually in, intentionally infected, orally infected animals just to study this disease. Um, several years ago now. So usually we believe the organism in is ingested or eaten through contaminated feed or possibly milk, colostrum, although there are other, are other mechanisms of infection. But let's say it takes 20 hours to reach the small intestine. The ileum is just a section of the small intestine where it likes to hang out. Um, then it will take another several months to invade the intestine wall and it colonizes or sets up housekeeping in the lymph nodes lining the intestine. And then it could take another couple of years, two or three years even, before it, it multiplies to the point where it breaks out of those lymph nodes back into the lumen of the intestine and then can be shed in the feces. And that's where the organism is shed out into the environment, contaminating the environment or water or feed or pasture or whatever. Um, and be, that becomes a source of exposure to other animals. So that could be up to three years before they become shedders. And then um, later, if, you know, again, it can take another two to four years um, in total, um, it will disseminate out of the, the intestinal lymph nodes in that region to other organs or other tissues. So that's where we see potentially in utero infection. So the more advanced clinical in, clinically infected cows, 
uh, could have a fetus in there and the fetus is actually born infected. That doesn't happen often, but it does, it does happen. Or the organism uh, migrates to lymph nodes in the mammary gland and now the organism is shed in milk or in colostrum. So those could be other sources of infection or exposure to susceptible animals. So that's how the disease works. Um, it's in, it's common in, in the environments, whether that's feces or lagoons or pastures or runoff water. It's commonly found in the environments of infected herds. And again, this is some Minnesota data, um, but uh, Aron Reisman demonstrated that if we, if we go on to known infected herds, so this, the cows have been tested, we know there are infected cows in this herd, um, if we collect 10 fecal samples just at random out of the alleyways, transfer alleys behind the cows, <laughs> lagoons even, um, we can pool 10 fecal samples, we create a pooled sample, we culture that, and 77% of the time in our own study, we could get a positive environmental sample in an infected herd. So um, some of the time now, uh, people who are screening herds, just to see, it, ask the question, is this herd infected? Not is this cow infected, but rather is this herd infected, um, they will sometimes look to environmental sampling instead of sampling 30 random adult cows. You could do either or, but it turns out environmental sampling, it's not perfect sensitivity, you're not going to detect all of them, but it's a quick screening tool. Um, and as to the prevalence in the U.S. at least, um, the last NOM study, this is USDA national nationwide study, this was conducted in 2007, they did that environmental sampling that I just described and they uh, estimated that 68% of U.S. herds are infected, meaning they've got one or more cows shedding the organism and they found it in that environment. So we have a, a very high prevalence, herd level prevalence of this disease in the United States. Canada is slightly less, I'm not certain what it is here but I know, I know from talking to veterinarians among you that it's a concern here as well. All right, so that's a little bit of the background, um, why it matters, how common is it. Now the question is how do we control it? And to know how we're going to control something, we need to know how it's transmitted and then we can tackle those control points, if you will. Now two different places we can transmit. We can consider transmission between herds, taking infected animals from an infected herd to an uninfected herd and that introduces it to an infect or sorry a clean herd so this is uh, this is just a sale sale barn in um, Minnesota and you, you go you buy a cow sight unseen you have no idea of the history of the herd she's coming from and you are at well 68 percent risk if you just want to flip a coin of buying an animal from an infected herd that's not to say she's infected but but you are putting yourself at risk. So movement between herds is one way of, of transmission, obviously. And our best recommendation for controlling this, because I'm not going to talk about this any further, but is to purchase animals from herds that are likely to be free, likely to be low risk. And I'm not sure about the UK, but in the US and in Canada, there are voluntary testing programs. The producer pays for them, not the government. But um, herds will go in and do voluntary testing of, they'll start with 30 cows, and if they're negative with 30 cows, they're, you know, that's a good, good likelihood they're, they're free. And then the next year they'll do a whole herd test, whether serum ELISA, milk ELISA, something like that. And if that's negative, um, then we're more certain that they're likely to be free. And they can move through four years from a level one to a level two, three, and level four. Um, category and we believe that the love if you're in level three or level four if you've tested three or four years in a row and you're still negative you are likely to be a free herd and those herds are actually put in a registry because it, it, it's a good thing if you're free um, that people can access online so the Minnesota Board of Animal Health you can go into their website and find the registry of status level three and four herds and so if you chose to you could go and source animals from those herds and that would reduce your risk of um, buying the disease and of course well presumably those those owners can charge a premium for their animals if they're selling them I don't know if they actually get to do that or not but um, if you chose to do so that could limit your risk here now what I'm going to focus on mostly this morning though is, is how to control transmission within a herd so if you have an infected herd 
or you don't know your status, but you want to limit the risk anyway, how do we control transmission from this, un or sorry, if she's an infected cow, transmission from her to another cow or to the next generation? So there we need to understand how, you know, what are the sources of exposure. We believe that fecal oral is the most common source of route of exposure through contaminated feed, water, environment, you know, just the manure contaminating the grass, the bedding, whatever. Um, I mentioned colostrum or milk. It can be shed in subclinical animals in colostrum and milk, typically at very low levels, but it has been found there. <clears throat> and then I, I mentioned already transplacental transmission especially in cows that are in the more advanced stages of the disease. So if these are the routes of exposure, um, then we can <coughs> tackle each of those individually and, and come up with control plans to, um, to kind of nip that one in the bud or this one in the bud or whatever to reduce our risk. All right, so this leads us to these questions, and this is 15 years ago now. These, these are the questions being asked. Can we control Yoni's disease in dairy herds? And if so, how? What will be the key management practices that we need to implement to do this? Um, <clears throat> given what we thought we knew about routes of exposure, then we came up with a likely risk, you know, list of, of, of practices that should work. But this is just an educated guess 15 years ago. You know, in theory, if we test cows and we remove the high shedding cows or the, the, the positive cows from the herd, that will reduce exposure in the herd because they're, those cows aren't around shedding, contaminating the environment. In theory, we could manage this maternity pen to have it very clean when that calf hits the ground. And then we can remove the calf very, very quickly from that contaminated environment. And in theory, that should reduce transmission to the next generation. In theory, we can manipulate our colostrum or milk feeding practices. In theory, if we took this young heifer and took her off site away from the adult herd where she's reared in a presumably clean environment, that should reduce exposure. And in theory, if we buy <coughs> replacements from low risk herds, all of these should work, but 15 years ago, these were all theoretical. Nobody had tested these. So that led us, and this, this series of, of, of projects that I'm, I'm <coughs> leading up to, to, to test those questions individually. Now, comprehensively, um, they seem to work. If you just put all those practices in a basket and you try to apply all of them on farms, they seem to work. And I'm going to show you some data right now that demonstrates that. Um, this is the Minnesota Yonis Disease Demonstration Herd Control Program, and Pennsylvania had one, um, New York, I'm not sure, may have had one, um, Wisconsin. So a few different states invested in these long-term control programs, just in a handful of herds. So in Minnesota, it was eight herds, and the, the Board of Animal Health paid for this. Um, and so they, they followed every herd from five to 10 years. These were known positive herds, fairly high prevalence of disease, usually 10 to 20% uh, positive on serum ELISA. And the herd owners agreed that you know, for five to 10 years, whatever this, this, this program lasts, we will follow your recommendations. We will implement whatever you recommend for us. And so there was, um, annual testing of every adult cow in the herd, so once a year, using both fecal culture and serum ELISA. That, so that was used to identify positive cows. The owner was encouraged but not required to, to sell positive animals. They were encouraged, but as you know, if you've got too many positive animals, you can't afford to call them all at once, right? But at least they knew who they were and they were encouraged to call the strong positives, the high shedders. They were asked to record the dates and reasons for culling. So if an animal did leave with signs consistent with clinical Yonis disease, we knew that. Um, then uh, a trained um, state uh, veterinarian that works for the Board of Animal Health went out and did an annual risk assessment. So they went through the areas of maternity pen management, uh, colostrum feeding practices, milk feeding practices, uh, heifer rearing sites, and so forth. And they did a, a risk assessment and scored herds as being uh, low, meaning this is good, this, you're doing a good job, this is a low risk area, or oops, this is maybe a high risk area. And if you scored high on a risk assessment, then you were uh, encouraged to change you know, whatever practice was involved there to try to reduce your risk. So that was done annually for the five or 10 years. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so that's what happened. Annual testing, annual risk assessment, and then encouraged the producers to act on that information and aggressively try to tackle this disease. And so, so we looked at this data at the end of the study, at the end of the 10 years, to ask the question, well, 
we implemented these programs in these herds, and these eight herds, did things get better? Well, how do we know if things got better? So what we did was compare the, um, the cows that were in the herd at the beginning of the project that hadn't been subjected to the control program, so they would be the worst case scenario, right, um, to cows that were born later after the program had been implemented, and presumably those cows were at reduced risk. So, so Scott Wells and his graduate student actually did this study. Um, so let's pretend that in, in a given herd, the program, the control program was implemented in the year 2000, so that was year zero. So we have cows that were born two years ago, cows that were born one year ago, and they were not subjected to the control program, so they were exposed, you know, however, whatever was going on in that herd. And then we have animals born one, two, three, four, or five years after implementing the control program. And presumably, if the program is working, these animals should be at lower risk, controlling for age. They, they should be at lower risk for contracting the disease than these animals. And, and then every year again, um, the state veterinarian came in and did the risk assessment score. And they scored five different areas. So, like I mentioned, the calving area, pre-weaned heifer housing and, and management, post-weaned heifer housing and management, bred heifers, and then adult cow management. So they got a score for each of these areas and then a cumulative risk assessment score. And if the score was really high, that meant <clears throat> you were doing a lot of risky practices. Um, if the score was really low, that meant they thought you were doing a really good job implementing steps to control the disease. So in theory, the risk assessment score should have been highest or worst prior, you know, for these animals prior to implementing the program, and then it should be progressively better after the program was in, implemented. And then also the, the risk for disease also, you know, should be highest for this group of animals, and if the program is working, the risk should be progressively less over time for the, the younger animals. So, did it work? So this is the risk assessment score. Every line, every dotted line here recommend, represents one of the eight herds. Okay, and the solid line is just the average risk assessment score for all eight herds lumped together. And so what we're seeing here is this is the, the risk assessment score, so, you know, very high, like 100 would be really, really bad management, uh, you know, promoting a lot of yoni's transmission. Zero would be very, very good. So what we can see is for the birth cohorts, minus two years, minus one year, um, prior to implementing the control program, the risk assessment scores are the highest or the worst. And over time, um, all herds did um, were able to reduce their risk assessment scores. So the, some better than others, some were more aggressive than others at implementing the changes, but overall um, producers did reduce their, their, their score. So in theory, we're reducing the risk for transmission of yonis. Now did that happen? So that leads us to this next slide. So this is the, this is the hazard ratio, I just call it the risk. Um, <clears throat> for testing positive to yonis, or MAP, with either bacterial culture, so this is fecal culture in the little round thing, round circles here, or with serum ELISA, and you could use serum or milk, and that's in the little square boxes here. And so what we see is over time, the cohorts of animals um, that were born and subjected to the regular management prior to the control program, they are the baseline, so the hazard is one, that's, that's their starting point. And then over time, the animals that are born subsequently after implementing the program, their risk relative to baseline is reducing. And this is adjusted for age, so you don't need to worry about that confounding thing. So it appears that this comprehensive control program, doing the annual risk assessments and then acting on the risk assessments in those five different management areas, it appears that over time, on average for these herds, was reducing the risk. Now, is the prevalence, you know, Five years later, is the prevalence zero? Did these herds eradicate this disease? No, they did not eradicate it, not yet. And in, in theory, when you, we, nobody's done the study that goes out to 10 or 15 years, but the modelers, the people who are modeling these curves, predict it might take 15 years, if ever, to eradicate this disease from a herd. But this does show that we can reduce the prevalence over time and you know, in that way at least reduce the economic impact, the welfare impacts on a herd. So we didn't continue this demonstration herd project out for 10 or 15 years, the money ran out, 
But hopefully, and in theory, if these producers keep up with these practices, um, this hopefully, you know, eventually we get to zero, although we, you know, we can't say that for certain. All right, so that looked to be working. So in conclusion, that was the demonstration herd project. Um, we were able to show a reduction in incidence of Yoni's disease over time, so this combination of practices seemed to be working. The, they did demonstrate that the herds that implemented the, the changes better or more aggressively did do a better job of reducing prevalence than the, the people that didn't, you know, weren't quite as aggressive in making changes in their management. Um, so that seemed to be working, it seemed to be doing, doing what we hoped it would do. The problem with that study is though, it, 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 was a, it was a combination of a number of different practices that were implemented and we don't know which of those practices were doing the job. Were all of those changes to maternity pen management, heifer rearing, et cetera, et cetera, were all of those things important in helping to get to the end result of reduced prevalence? Or are there some points that are more important than others? Because if we're going to go out and, and make recommendations to our producers, you know, we need to prioritize where do you put your energies, where do you put your focus, what's going to have the biggest impact. So the next question in this line of thinking is if the whole program works, let's tease the program apart and see which individual changes are having the biggest impact, which ones are working and maybe some aren't working. So that takes us to the individual routes of exposure transmission and again, theoretically, um, to control fecal oral uh, transmission, we could address the maternity pen management off-site or segre segregated heifer rearing, maybe vaccination. Um, for colostrum management, we can avoid practices like pooling colostrum, that would be the, the biggest high-risk scenario. Uh, maybe we could look to using commercial colostrum replacers or heat treating. For milk, we would put, presumably avoid feeding raw milk. We would feed either pasteurized milk or commercial milk replacer. And in uterine transmission, there's really no way to control that other than to get rid of the positive dams. Um, it's the occasional producer who's really aggressive, if the dam tests positive and she has a positive, sorry, she has a heifer calf in the herd, they will, tell, they will sell the heifer of the dam just to reduce this risk, but that's pretty aggressive and not many people take it to that degree. But in theory, we could be looking at all of these different areas. What we didn't know though from the previous study is which one of these was working, which was having the biggest impact. So that led us to a series of clinical trials, each one of these individually looking at these separate interventions or management um, strategies. So what's the effect of maternity housing, off-site heifer rearing, colostrum management, whether it's substitutes or heat treating, uh, feeding pasteurized milk, or vaccination. So there were separate clinical trials set up at different places around the country to investigate each of these questions individually, and so that's what I'm gonna launch into here next. So we'll start with um, maternity pen management. So the, the common thought prior to doing this work is that we want, whether it's a group pack calving pen type thing or it's an individual maternity pen that the animal has moved into, she calves and then she leaves right away and the calf leaves right away, um, regardless of the pen we want it to be clean, dry, well bedded and we want to remove that calf from that environment as quickly as possible. Usually we give the cow 30 to 60 minutes to lick the calf dry and then we get the calf out of there. That was the, the thinking prior to this. Now there was some theory that an individual maternity pen should be more successful in controlling yonis than this because in the group pack, if one cow has been hanging out there for the last 10, 15 days, whatever, and she's shedding into the environment, then everybody born into that environment is exposed. Whereas with the individual pen, <clears throat> if we can clean that pen out between individual uses, or at least once a day, clean the bedding straight out, spray it down, re-bed it, then this should be a much cleaner environment, there should be lower risk here. So in theory, this was our gold standard maternity environment, but nobody had ever tested that hypothesis. So that was the, the point of this first uh, study. The objective was to evaluate being born into an individual pen as compared to a group pack environment and to see if that had any effect on the calf's subsequent risk for testing positive to yonis when it grew up. And all of these studies are very long-term studies. We have to have the calf born and then we have to wait for five years basically. We tested the, all of these animals in their first, second, third lactation to see if they eventually got yonis. So these are all long-term studies that I'm about to describe to you. 
This was done in Minnesota. It was done in three Yonis infected herds that had more than 10% seroprevalence according to blood testing. And what Scott, Scott Wells actually ran this study. So in each of the three herds, <clears throat> the herds had been using a pack environment. They went in and built some individual box dolls or maternity pens. And then um, over a course of one year, as cows were calve or approaching calving, they were alternately assigned to calve either in the group pack environment or into the individual maternity pen. And they had 449 heifer calves born, um, roughly, well, 238 born in the individual <coughs> pens, 211 born in the group pens. And then those animals were Apart from where they were born, they were reared in the same farm, managed under the same other practices. So they grew up and they were tested in the first, second, and third lactation for positive uh, Yoni's test with fecal culture and serum ELISA. And so at the end of the day, these are the results. This gets a little bit hairy, but uh, this is the, the final model looking at the risk of, well, here's the calving pen. So just ignore the other stuff at the moment. Just focus on calving pen. So we have individual pen versus multiple group pen. If the multiple group pen is our reference, so the hazard is one, um, then the individual, if you were born in an individual cow pen, you were roughly 40%, the, the risk for you testing positive with uh, ELISA was roughly 40% reduced. And the risk for you testing positive for fecal culture was roughly 70% reduced as compared to the group pen. So it would appear from this study that being born in an individual pen cleaned out between uses did reduce the risk of, of eventual uh, Yoni's positivity. Now another interesting thing I'll point out in this study, another variable that emerged was the status of the dam when she gave birth to that calf. Um, if she was a non-shedder versus a light shedder versus a heavy shedder, this is the, the, col the colonies of organisms concentration in her feces that they can grow. Um, as compared to a negative shedder, so the risk is one there, um, if you were a, a heavy shedder, even a light shedder, but more so a heavy shedder, so in the more advanced stages of the disease, there was almost a five times greater risk that the calf born to that dam tested positive for yonis with ELISA, almost a four times greater risk testing positive for fecal culture. Now, why were those calves more likely to be yonis positive? Was it in utero exposure? Was it exposure temporarily to that dam in the maternity pen? Uh, was it exposure to her colostrum? This, this study didn't tease that out, but it just says, if my mom was positive when I was born, if she was a strong positive, I'm at greater risk. We don't know exactly through what means, but I am at greater risk. So bottom line from this study is that if you could adopt an individual maternity pen uh, system, it would seem to reduce the risk for yoni. So that could be one thing we can put on our list. All right, the next one we hear about, we heard about a lot, was off-site heifer rearing. Um, so in theory, if we take the calf away from the adult cows, away from their contaminated environment, water, pasture, bedding, whatever, um, and grow them up in a clean environment, they should be clean, in theory, when they come into the milking herd. So there was a study to set up uh, to test this, to evaluate this question. Ian Gardner did this out in California. <coughs> they had one infected herd, um, and they want to evaluate the effect of off-site versus on-site heifer rearing on Yoni's transmission in the young stock. They had a 3,100 cow herd, like I said, in California. And how they set this up, it was a, a cohort study. They had three, three groups of 800 animals, so these are kind of like our treatment groups. Um, the first group of 800 animals was raised on site on the, on the same premise as the adult milking herd. So from birth to 22 months when you calve and enter the milking herd. The second cohort of 800 animals was raised on site until five months of age. And then they were moved to a different site, it happened to be in Nevada, but it could have been you know, two miles down the road, as long as it's clean. And then the third cohort of 800 animals was raised off site from from, for the whole period, from two days to two, 22 months. So we've got total exposure, no exposure, and then kind of intermediate first five months of potential exposure to the adult herd, and then nothing after that. And then again, they tested these animals for three consecutive lactations to see what the test positive rate was in the three groups. So now this is, I, I haven't got the third lactation data. This is preliminary data I'm showing you today, but um, so they enrolled 800 animals per group, remember. 
Of those, roughly 600 entered the milking herd, so they had some attrition along the way. They lost some animals or sold some animals before they calved, so roughly 600 calved in for the first lactation. And here is the, the ELISA, the serum ELISA blood test. Um, this is the proportion that tested positive in either the first or second lactation, 4.6% in the total on-site, 3.6% um, in the intermediate, and then 2.3% in the off-site heifer system. And then if they looked at the proportion culled in the first or second lactation, 27%, 24%, 21%. Now I don't have the final statistics on these. I don't know if they're statistically significant. I don't know what the third lactation results are yet. But you can see we're headed in the right direction. If it's not statistically significant, at least numerically, it, it's trending down, which would suggest that this is a useful intervention. All right. Another uh, study, this is a natural experiment uh, in Minnesota that was really, really interesting. Have any of you heard the, the theory that uh, it, it's only the calves that are susceptible to infection, but the adult cows are immune? They're not going to get it infected? So that was the dogma. Um, and I'm going to present some data here that, that uh, refutes that. Um, this, was to this study was to determine if cattle that were clean, were never exposed as babies or up to two years of age, if they were later introduced into an infected herd, into a contaminated environment, could they contract infection as adults, if they see the organism as adults for the very first time? Um, so this is a really interesting, it was, a, like I said, a natural experiment. We have, like I mentioned, we have this registry of likely uninfected herds, level three, level four herds in Minnesota. So we know who these herds are. And Scott Wells jumped on this opportunity. He saw um, 59 cows from uninfected herds. So they were born, they were raised, they were springers in these uninfected herds, so presumably never exposed. They were purchased as springers, as two-year-olds, and moved into known infected herds. And so what Scott did, this is really smart, um, so there are four Yoni's <coughs> infected herds that these 59 cows were purchased into. He took age-matched controls so the, the case cows are the animals that grew up in a clean herd. The age-matched control cows are animals of the same age, but they grew up in the infected herd. And he, he, so they calved in at roughly the same time in the infected herd, and then they both went on to live in the infected herd, and they were tested for the next three years. So then Scott was able to compare the, the risk for testing positive in this group that was raised in the contaminated environment versus the risk of testing positive in this group that was raised you know, for the first two years in the clean environment. He was able to compare those. It's a really nice natural experiment. So this is a survival curve that shows us the results from this study. This is the proportion of animals that test positive using the serum ELISA test. Um, so at the beginning, so this is age in months. At the beginning, nobody has tested positive because we hadn't started testing yet, but he started testing in the, the first, second, and third lactation. Um, so, you know, roughly 30, 40, 50 months of age. And the black line is the rate of testing positive to yonis for the animals that were reared in the infected herd. And the red line is the rate of testing positive for the animals that were reared originally in the clean herds. And so there's two really neat things to come from this data. First of all, if you were reared in the infected herd, you tested positive sooner. Okay, you were more into the more advanced stages of the disease, you mounted an immune response, you became a positive, positive earlier than the other group of animals. So, so being reared in a clean environment delays infection, delays testing positive. However, these animals still eventually caught up, didn't they? They eventually, they were exposed as adults, they got the disease, they mounted an immune response and tested positive. So this kind of flies in the face of the, the dogma that adults are immune. They're not immune. You can still contract the infection and, and develop the disease as an adult. But if you can delay that exposure, then you will delay testing positive, delay, you know, she'll be older when the disease hits her, so to speak. And so from an from a economic point of view, if nothing else, that should be a good thing. We want to delay the age of exposure. Um, and this is just, again, the, the final regression model, and it just says if you were reared in the exposed herd, and that's the, the relative risk of one, that's our control group, um, if you were reared in the clean herd, then 
they, they had like a 97% reduced risk of testing positive to the blood test and a 88% uh, reduced risk of testing positive with fecal culture. So basically, if you can rear an animal in a clean herd, <coughs> that delays or reduces the risk for the disease. So it, it points to the offside or heifer rearing again. Okay. Colostrum. Um, we know that cows that are subclinically infected sometimes can shed the organism in colostrum or milk. So this is this was another point of exposure that we were concerned about. And so historically, we've we've said, well, if you're testing and you know you've got a positive cow, then obviously you don't feed her colostrum to a heifer calf. Uh, don't pool raw colostrum. You know, if one cow is shedding and you don't know it, you feed that one cow to one calf, you've only exposed one calf. But if you pool it and feed it to multiple calves, now you've exposed multiple calves. So at the very least, producers can do these types of things. But there were additional tools coming onto the market and th that were uh, purported to be maybe control uh, mechanisms or management strategies for this. So one is uh, the use of colostrum replacers. Now they emerged, oh, 15 years ago or even earlier um, in the US marketplace and the first products were really, really lousy and the products are getting better now. This is a study that we did um, in 2002, something like that. We took a colostrum replacer, and it, this is in 12 herds, Yoni's infected herds. We had roughly 500 heifer calves, and when the calves hit the ground, they were assigned to be fed either a, a replacer, um, powdered colostrum, or um, raw maternal colostrum. This is prior to having developed a technique for heat treating colostrum. So we had a little, little over 200 animals per group, and then we grew them up, tested them in the first, second, and third lactation for yonis, just as we've done before, serumalized in fecal culture. And these are the results from that study. <clears throat> so again, we tested them at roughly 30, 40, 54 months of age for second and third lactation. This is the test positive rate uh, over time. So in the maternal colostrum group, at the end of the study, 12% had tested positive. In the replacer group, 8% had tested positive. So this was a significant difference. Um, so it seemed that using the colostrum replacer, t well, two take home messages. One, it appeared that raw colostrum can be a source of infection because these are different. Or flip that message on its, you know, the inverse is, would be that replacers would seem to be one tool that we could adopt to control transmission. So that's, that's the colostrum replacer. Um, talked about this yesterday a little bit. We've also developed an approach to heat treating colostrum. So similar to pasteurizing milk, if maybe if we heat treat colostrum, we can destroy this organism and others, you know, leucosis or other salmonella, mycoplasma, things that might be arriving and, and work th make that work. So we developed a strategy using a 60 degree centigrade for 60 minute protocol. And uh, I think tomorrow I give a colostrum talk and I'll go into this in a lot more detail then. But in inoculation studies in the lab, if we use this protocol for colostrum, we didn't cook the IgG, because obviously we don't want to denature the IgG, because that's very important to the calf. But we were able to eliminate or significantly reduce E. coli, yoni, salmonella, mycoplasma, and listeria and just reduce overall total plate counts and coliform counts in the colostrum. So in a lab setting, it seemed to work. Um, also, we noted that calves fed heat treated colostrum, they absorbed more of the IgG. They ended up with higher serum IgG levels than the calves fed raw colostrum, which was really interesting. Now, the bottom line, the question is, okay, fine, just, you can, but just because you can, should you, um, does it result in a ha healthier calf? Um, so we did a large, we've done a few studies now, but this is the largest study we've done evaluating the heat treated colostrum. This is done, whoops, excuse me in um, <clears throat> sorry, six large studies in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin, 1,500 to 2,500 cows per herd. Um, they were set up, each of the six herds was set up with a batch pasteurizer. Um, they were larger herds, so they might have 10 or 15 cows calving per day. So every day they would take the fresh colostrum and refrigerate it, and then they were, when they were ready to assemble a batch, they pulled it out of the refrigerator, pooled it, split it in half. Half was fed fresh or raw. The other half went through the heat treatment uh, protocol and then was fed as, as heat treated colostrum. So they ended up with uh, gallon jugs of heat treated colostrum or gallon jugs of raw colostrum sitting in the fridge and then as calves were born they were just systematically assigned to be fed one or the other. So we ended up with over 500 calves per treatment group in this study. 
Um, and we, we looked, sorry, backing up a bit. We, we tested the colostrum for IgG levels and, and total plate counts, bacteria counts. We tested the calves for serum IgG to, to see how did passive transfer work. And we also looked at the health of the calves from birth to weaning um, thus far. And so here are the, the preliminary results. And this, this has been published. Um, the, this is the colostrum. This is total plate count, total coliform count in the heat-treated colostrum. Um, the blue, blue is the raw, the maroon, whatever that color that is, is heat rated. So we, we got roughly a two or two and a half log reduction in bacteria counts, so that's good. It's not sterilizing it, but it's reducing bacterial exposure. This is the serum IgG level in the calves, sorry, in the colostrum, 61 grams or 59 grams per liter. So pretty high quality colostrum on average, no significant difference there, so we weren't harming the IgG. And this is the interesting bit at the bottom here. This is the serum IgG levels in the calves. So calves were fed the same volume, the same timing, all the rest of it. The only difference was, was it raw or heat treated? Here we have a serum IgG of 15.5 in the raw group or 18 milligrams per mil in the heat treated group. And the, the interesting question is, why did these calves absorb more IgG? And I think the answer to that question is, whoops, backing up, is that by having fewer bacteria, what we think is happening is the bacteria in the gut actually block or interfere with IgG absorption. And so these calves having cleaner colostrum will absorb more IgG, and so they end up with higher levels in the blood. But both these groups are still pretty high. They, these, are, these are very good levels of IgG. So, so does this matter? Um, did it affect health? So here's the health data in the pre-weaning, sorry, yeah, pre-weaning period from birth to weaning. Um, this study was conducted in the summertime months, so mortality was relatively low, around 2% for both groups. Other diseases, bloat, navel ill, this is respiratory disease. We have relatively low incidence of these diseases in the pre-weaning period, and there's no significant difference between the treatment groups here. But when we get to scours, or if we lump all diseases together and just ask the question, were you treated for a disease? I don't care which one, but any disease. Then we do see significant differences with the calves being fed the heat-treated colostrum having a lower risk for scours and a lower risk for any disease. Now, that predominantly, that's attributed to scours. So it does appear that the calves are healthier. Now, in the long run, are they healthier? Do they make more milk? Um, did they have less yonis? Um, I don't have the slide here. I'll tell you my, my preliminary look at the data, and I have to get this finalized and published yet. The preliminary says there was no difference in the long run, but in the short run, they were healthier. So is this a technology that is cost effective? I don't know. Um, there seems to be a biological benefit in the short term. In the long term, there didn't seem to be a benefit, which was unexpected. I hope there would be. But so this isn't a tool that everybody wants to adopt, um, but a lot of our larger herds are adopting it just for this purpose that they do see healthier calves in the short term. Okay. Uh, moving on, we're getting to near the end, I think. A uh, couple more intervention studies that we looked at. Uh, one was the pasteurized milk study. Uh, again, 15 years ago when I arrived in Minnesota, commercial pasteurizers were just being introduced at the time for use on farm to pasteurize waste milk. And uh, an obvious question is, well, do they work? Will they control Yoni's transmission? So the, one of the very first studies I did arriving in Minnesota was to say, if we pasteurize waste milk in a Yoni's infected herd, will we control transmission of this disease? So this study was set up in two Yoni's infected farms in Minnesota, high prevalence herd. One was an 800 cow dairy, a larger dairy. One was 150 cow, smaller dairy. But he served as the, uh, the calf grower for both dairies. So all of the calves went to this one calf grower, this one site. So how this worked was um, we had a 10 month study. We enrolled a little over 400 calves over the 10 months. And heifers and bulls both were enrolled. And when they arrived at a day of age, they were put into one of two greenhouses. If you were even ear tag calf, you got put on this side, odd ear tag calf, put in that side. <clears throat> and um, on one side, they were fed pasteurized milk from the 800 cow dairy. And so this is Yoni's infected milk, pasteurized through a batch pasteurizer. And if you were on the other side, you were fed a 2020 milk replacer program. In the summer, we fed four liters a day. In the winter, we fed six liters a day because, Mike, this was back in 2001 when nutritionists said, you feed four liters a day. Um, obviously, if I were to do the study again now, I would feed at least eight liters a day. Um, but anyway, they were matched on volume, um, batch pasteurized milk or the 2020 milk replacer. 
Uh, so we ended up with a little over 200 calves enrolled per group. Uh, statistics on arrival were not different. Serum total proteins were not different. Weights, you know, roughly 40 kilos. Um, weaning age, because this guy weaned by age, not different, 47 days, 46 days, that was all the same. But when we looked at average daily gain, the rate of gain in these calves, we had 0.34 kilos per day in the 2020 milk replacer group versus 0.47 kilos in the pasteurized whole milk group. Is anyone shocked that the, the whole milk calves gain more weight? You shouldn't be, right, because we know the level of protein, level of fat, they're just getting more nutrients. You know, same volume, more nutrients. So nobody was surprised that they grew better. What was really interesting, though, is that the, the health of these calves was very, very different. This is, over the 10-month study, this is the treatment rate in the pre-weaning period. Fed the 2020 milk replacer, 32% treatment. Fed the whole milk, 12% treatment. And this 32% is typical of USDA statistics across the nation. This is, this is pretty representative. If you broke it out in calves born in winter versus summer months, you can see we had fewer sick calves overall in the summer than in the winter. And that goes back to that greenhouse barn, hoop barn, badly ventilated. We have more disease in general in the winter. But you can see whether it's summer or winter, um, if you were fed the whole milk, you were less likely to get sick, less likely to be, to be treated. And this is the mortality rates in these two groups. Over the whole 10-month study, almost 12% versus 2%. This is bang on with USDA statistics for the nation. So, um, but what was really interesting, we didn't have a lot of death loss in the summer months, 2% thereabouts. However, in the winter months, if you were on the 2020 milk replacer program, you fell off the cliff. There's like one in five calves died in that group. So why did the calves fed the whole milk? They were healthier overall. They died less in the winter. What do you think? Probably it's just the improved plane of nutrition supports a better immune response. Probably that's it. Now, there may be other goodies arise, arriving in the waste milk, immunoglobulins and lactoferrins and lysozymes and growth factors. There may be other things adding to gut health, but probably it's an it's, it's a, a, a improved plane of nutrition explanation, right? We think so. Anyway, that was not the f reason we did the study. The reason we did the study was we wanted to know if pasteurizing milk controlled yonis, remember? Um, and so we used the 2020 milk replacer as the control group. Um, I actually wanted to have a negative control group. I wanted to feed raw milk to a group of calves, but I couldn't find a producer in Minnesota that was stupid enough to sign on to that study. One guy said, I'll do it as long as you buy all the infected cows five years from now, but I didn't have the deep pockets to do that. So, so we had, in fact, a positive control group in this study, the milk replacer group. And so in, in theory, if the pasteurized milk the pasteurizer controlled the disease, then there would be no more yonis in that group when they grew up than the milk replacer group. So we did follow them to adults. Now, sadly, the bull calves disappeared and a whole bunch of heifers disappeared, just were sold, dispersed around the country. So sadly, my sample size went from 200 to about 50, which is lousy. Um, I learned a lesson from this uh, study. Don't put all your eggs in one basket or one herd. But in any case, we did get the milk yield for the first and second lactations. We looked at uh, the culling or death rates in the first, second, and third lactations. We followed them to 57 months, and we tested them in the first, second, and third lactation for yonis, as we did for the previous studies. And what we're seeing here, um, funny, funny enough, we didn't see, a, this is the pasteurized milk group, milk replacer group. We saw a numeric but not a statistically significant improvement in milk production in the first lactation. In the second lactation, there was a 2,000 kilo advantage in, the, in, in this group. Overall, there was roughly a 2,000 kilo advantage, 1,900 kilo advantage in the pasteurized milk group. Um, the proportion that had been culled by the time they were 57 months of age, 42% versus 54%, that was significant. Um, so if you had been fed whole milk as a baby, you were less likely to have been culled by, by this point in time. And that makes sense. If you make more milk, they're likely to keep you around longer, right? And when we looked at the Yoni's positive rate, test positive rate, um, it was 28% versus 22%. Now, I have a lousy sample size, and so my, you know, my p-value is, it's, these are not statistically different. But the point is, this number is not higher. This number is actually lower, numerically lower, than the control group. So I'm pretty comfortable, even with a lousy, you know, small sample size, saying, this number, we did not see numerically or statistically numerically more yonis in the pasteurized milk group. So it seems that the pasteurizer controlled yonis transmission through that waste milk. 
All right. Last thing, and then I better wrap it up. What's, how many am I? I'm not getting uh, ugly looks. I'm just about to get an ugly look. Okay. Uh, the last study that was done was um, looking at vaccination. I, I'm, we have TB in a few different states in the U.S., and so the concern with vaccinating, do you vaccinate here at all for Yonis? Not an option. I wouldn't expect so. It's, it's, it's sparingly used in the U.S. Be the concern is that if we vaccinate this animal as a calf, they're done about four months of age, um, you see these big granulomatous lumps, you know, she's been vaccinated, and if you vaccinate yourself in the thumb, you get an equally ugly granulomatous lump in your thumb. So people don't like to do it. But the, the biggest concern is that if you're vaccinated, then that will interfere with TB testing. And, uh, you know, how do you test her? Because she's gonna be, she's gonna cross-react. So, so some states allow vaccination, but for the most part, it's discouraged. And you have, if you're a producer looking to vaccinate, you want to, you have to get special permission from the state veterinarian to allow you to do it. And they typically only allow the very high prevalence herds that are really suffering big losses. They will allow those herds to start vaccinating. But you do have to get special permission to do it. But this was a study done in Wisconsin. Um, they had um, three dairies, infected herds, um, and so they randomized calves at four months of age to be either vaccinated or not vaccinated. So they ended up with about 150 calves per group, and then they followed them up and tested them as adults. Um, this is the proportion that were fecal culture positive, 14% or 24%. So there was less shedding in the vaccinates as adults. Um, there were, tended to be, this is not statistically significant, there tended to be less culling with signs of clinical yonis disease, so that would fit with the shedding. Um, culling risk overall was not different though. So um, the, the take home message from that was that vaccination reduced shedding, but it, it's not necessarily affecting your culling rate. And, and anyone who starts vaccinating, you can't rely on vaccination as your only control program. If you just vaccinate and ignore everything else, you know, 10 years from now, you're still gonna have the disease. So, so this is a short-term bandage, if you will. Um, it may have some effect reducing the, the onset of shedding, the clinical severity, but um, it's not gonna be a, a fix in and of itself. All right, so just to sum up then, Pulling it all together, so we've looked at many different interventions alone to ask the question, does this work? Does this belong in our package? If we're putting together a control program, and this is the package, and this is what we're gonna recommend to producers, do each of these interventions belong in that control program? So this is, this is the summary then. Um, for maternity pen management, it would appear that the use of individual pens that are clean between uses works, it reduces risk. Off-site heifer rearing appears to work, although again, that was preliminary data, but it, the numbers were headed in the right direction. Um, delaying exposure until adulthood or delaying exposure as long as possible delays infection, so economically that, that's a useful thing. It doesn't prevent infection. Adults can still be infected as adults if they're exposed as adults, but by delaying it economically, that should be helpful. Colostrum replacers were helpful. Uh, feeding heat-treated colostrum, that's, like I said, it, it helped the health of the calf in the short term. My preliminary data says it didn't, uh, didn't change anything in the long term. So if they're gonna do that, do it for other reasons than yonis maybe. Um, pasteurizing waste milk did seem to control disease transmission. And vaccination uh, reduced the risk of fecal shedding and clinical disease, but didn't really change the longevity in the herd. So this cannot be used alone. You would still have to package it with everything else. All right, so in summary then, um, the tools, there are several tools available or management strategies available to help with the control of Yonis disease to reduce prevalence over time in infected herds. Um, we, we don't know again if we can get to eradication, but we do know that we can significantly reduce the prevalence in these herds and hopefully if these uh, strategies are applied long enough, we can get to eradication. So I think that's it, so we're, we're train, trying to minimize transmission. Yoni's disease is preventable and is controllable, so don't let it overwhelm you. It's, it's a long-term commitment, but you can make progress. And with that, I will thank you for your attention, and um, do we have time for questions? Questions, we'll have a few questions. All right. Okay, uh, there should be two guys with, um, can you give your name, and if you put your hand in there, they'll come with a mic, and if you, you give your name and your question, that'd be great. I think there's somebody at the back there. 
<coughs> Doug? And there's one further back, Doug, if you need to. Patrick Kelly, I'm... Yeah. Sorry, Patrick Kelly, I was just wondering, on your adult trial, did you follow the animals that didn't leave those non-infected herds to see if any of them had gotten infected? Uh, okay, so the, did everyone hear the question? Um, so in the, the study where the, we had the known negative herds and the, those animals were introduced to the positive herds, did they follow the negative herds? I don't, so did they follow the negative herds longer to make, make, ensure that they stayed negative? Um, to my knowledge, they did not. But, but they, could, they could have, and I just don't know about it. Um, so I, I have to say, I don't know. Probably, I'm guessing that since those were status level three and four herds, negative herds, those producers should have been motivated to continue testing to maintain their status level. And so that data should be available. And if, if you would like to know, um, why don't you drop me an email. When I get back to the states, I can bug Dr. Wells with your question, and I can get the answer to the question. Um, I know Dr. Wells didn't intentionally follow up in those herds, but those herds may have continued testing, and that data is probably available. So if you, if you want, get, get, you know, drop me an email. I'll, I'll find out the answer for you. Okay, next one at the back there, and can we have the mic? Um, Sam Cole, um, in your trial with uh, comparing individual calvin pens with group pens, were those calves snatched at birth, did you say? Yeah, the, these were larger, well, medium to large size dairies, 700 cows to 1,500 cows, the, the three dairies. And um, they, they were supposed to take the calf away as soon as they found the calf. So basically allow the calf to stay there maybe half an hour to an hour top so that the, the, the mother can lick it dry, but then get it out of there as promptly as you can. And that was true of both groups. Okay, another question. Yeah, Bill. Just speak. Just speak. Bill, Bill May. Uh, yeah, I was interested your data didn't seem to support the pasteurization to reduce diabetes G levels in cows. Uh, could you try any other uh, uh, pasteurization of AG for the human system to be good? Yeah, so just repeat the question yeah. just in case anybody didn't hear. Yeah. Um, Bill May was just asking whether or not um, any other techniques for pasteurization were used and looking at IgG levels. Yeah, so if you come to my colostrum talk tomorrow, which I, th I think is tomorrow, um, I, developing that 60-60 protocol took some trial and error. Um, we actually started pasteurizing colostrum at the, the, the traditional times and temperatures that we use for milk, which is much higher temperature, shorter time. And when we did that, bad things happened. We created a lot of pudding, we plugged up machines. Um, if you add a little cinnamon or nutmeg and some sugar, it was a lovely custard. <laughs> but, but you can't feed it to a calf, and you do denature easily a third of the antibodies at the higher temperature. So what we did was we empirically, we did the study in the lab, we walked our temperature down, 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 until we found the temperature where we weren't cooking the IgGs. Um, but it, it, it was a process finding that. And, and the inspiration for that was, um, you can buy pasteurized eggs in the shell in the supermarket that have been cooked you know, in a hot water bath or somehow um, to kill the salmonella and yet they haven't cooked the egg protein. Well, how did that work? Well, what they did was they found the critical temperature below which they wouldn't denature that albumin in the egg, but if you stay at that temperature long enough, you can kill, kill salmonella. So that was the, the empirical approach that we took to finding that. And if you want to come and see pictures of cooked pudding, you can come to my talk tomorrow and we can show okay, you Okay, so the talk will be tomorrow in the main seminar room. Um, can we leave it there because we've kind of run out of time? Um, and um, I'd just like to thank Sandra thank very you. much. Okay. Thank you very much.